Blue, latency be damned today. And we're live. It is Sunday, January 31st, 2021, 5.01 p.m. And I just want to say the, um, the change is in the air already, people. Uh, the snow has blanketed the ground in Washington in a glorious, this is our official one snowstorm per year in Washington. Um, uh, the days are getting longer. We are now, as of tonight, out of the coldest month of the year. Every day gets a little bit longer. It'll be spring before you know it. Trump is no longer in office, and Kate is no longer in Cape Cod. Today was the day that Studio A, or maybe it's Studio B of In Lieu of Fun, moved for Studio the first C. time. C. As you know, <laughs> for the first nine, ten months of In Lieu of Fun, we broadcast from one incompetent studio in Washington and one incompetent studio in Cape Cod, and occasionally from a third, even more incompetent studio in uh, the at the Cabin in the Woods. And uh, by the way, um, that uh, uh, to as of today, Kate is back in Brooklyn. So we now have a fourth incompetent location that we have, and this is the first one that has ever burned down. Because as <laughs> watchers of In Lieu of Fun I don't know, know if Nate knows this. No, well, I heard, but you mentioned that there was a lot of smoke damage. So I, I don't have the full details, but yeah, well, we're gonna, there was a candle, a candle that fell over or something. We're right? going to get the full details momentarily. Um, so uh, she drives back from Cape Cod today. There are cool pictures of her and the estimable John Shea driving home to everybody who tweeted that he hadn't changed his shirt. That sucks, guys, because like it's moving day. <laughs> who changes their shirt on moving day? Uh, stand with hashtag stand with John. Um, um, so, um, uh, all right, uh, Kate, we need an update. Okay. Uh, you're back in Brooklyn. How bad is the smoke damage? And do you have a front door? Oh, I can actually show you maybe the front door because it is actually really bad. Um, no, so um, I would like to point out, speaking of not changing your shirt, it's moving day. I am wearing the same outfit I wore yesterday <laughs> for the George Conway show. Um, I, I cleaned and picked up and packed my entire house until 2 a.m. And then I woke up at 6 and then I fell asleep in this outfit and then I in bed uh, and then I woke up and just kept wearing it and cleaning my house and packing. And we left around 1030 and um, and uh, got into Brooklyn around 415 as the first flakes of snow were starting to fall and rushed the car back to the rental place and now i'm in the apartment there is no internet i'm broadcasting from my phone um there is no most of the light light bulbs have burned out there's no heat so it's 55 degrees and there's a snow com a blizzard coming tomorrow so really great you'll remember the last week the apartment directly below mine caught on fire because of an errant candle and dog tail knocking it over um, so there's no smoke damage, but the entire apartment is covered in like dust and, um, detritus and let's get just... a better look. Oh, great. Thanks. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, uh, I'm no, this is like, this is my nice This is like what I usually sit in front of. And I used to do TV hits for my apartment, but like my bookcase that I built, but we're just kind of like putting things back together, but I don't know. The elevators are down, so for 45 minutes before the show, I just was running stuff up and down stairs, boxes and backpacks, and, like, I don't know. Um, I will say this. John and I have, like, a couple superpower that is, like, I would say one of the most remarkable superpowers for a couple to have, which is that we are so good at moving. Like, we are oh so good. <laughs> like, we just, like, we don't even talk. We both do exactly what we think needs to happen, and it ends up complementing each other perfectly. And then, like everything gets done, and like we like we cheer each other on, like we're just like in a like a ski race or something. Like we got a cowbell going, and I'm just like, yeah, John, scrub that. <laughs> like, like, 
get that grout. Good, good job. <laughs> like, anyway. Um, so anyway, we, it was a good move and we're back. It's kind of crazy. We're getting Indian food tonight. I'm, we both are shocked at how many people there are. There are people everywhere. I already walked out. But of no cormorants. I know. And I walked out of my apartment without a mask on. And like the doorman was like, what are you doing? And I was like, ah, like I'm just not used to like, I'm not, I'm literally, there was, I was, I was so isolated. There was no one, no one. Like if I went somewhere, it was like a very purposeful expedition out. And so I would put on a mask and it made sense. But like, um, I'm not accustomed to this. So it's just kind of strange. And there's all these like shacks all over the place these little outdoor shacks to like eat and drink in and it's very anyway and there was a line at whole foods like you would not believe it is like french toast like french toast like extravaganza oh because that's what i call it when you you get eggs and milk and bread right before a blizzard and everyone like i'm like what the fuck are you gonna do with that just make french toast (laughs) like i don't know Um, All of which is to say, Kate. Yeah, sorry for the long monologue. It's to say that we don't have fun anymore. But apparently we still, like, have, like, property interests in our (laughs) rented property (laughs) that that we haven't been in for 11 months. So. (laughs) And we have Nate personally. Oh, my gosh. And Nate personally. Oh, wait. That was, I did the sign off for the end that I usually. Yeah, yeah, but it's okay because it was charming. (laughs) It was cool because, like. One of the constants of the show is the tech problems. The other constant for the show is that tech K can't get the uh, the lines uh, right. The lines right, and that's you know awesome. Nate, welcome back. Nate, Thanks for having me back. Good to see you all. This so is so fun. Um, it is kind of amazing that we've had three shows since the Facebook Oversight Board issued its first set of opinions, and we haven't talked about them yet. Um, But uh, that's going to change today um, because uh, we have like uh, uh, unusual, shall we say, resources available on the subject of the Facebook Oversight Board. And two of them are here with me. So I'm going to shut up and basically just say there are five opinions uh, and uh, they involve, you know, war crimes, uh, 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 hate crimes, uh, nipples, and, um, and, you know, more war crimes and hate crimes. Um, uh, so Kate, Nate, take it away. And I'm just going to like, listen and learn. Yeah. Nate, and chime do you in with start, questions. Or do you want me to? Let, let me start. Let me start in the way that uh, since we, uh, Kate and I, I think had a bit of a mutual admiration society on Twitter in in the way that we were talking about what what is important here, which is that the fact that the oversight board is actually functional and doing something is, you know, we we need to pause and just recognize that that was not a foregone conclusion. Obviously, Kate's been the chronicler of everything related to the oversight board over the last few years. But uh, and and jump in, Kate, if you're interested. But but you know, th- there were constituencies inside Facebook that did not want this to to uh, go forward. There's a lot of pressure, of course, from the outside, and so it was not a foregone conclusion. And it remains a controversial institution, and we should recognize that. And those. Um, online and elsewhere who who think that we should not treat it as a real institution um there's there's some uh, rationale to that argument right that that um by we, we shouldn't assume that it is like a supreme court and we shouldn't uh, you know those of us who are looking at these decisions um we shouldn't think of this as a first best option um that uh, anybody who works in this area thinks that um you know that this is is by far not the right way that we should be doing sort of independent accountability of facebook or uh, outside oversight but it's what we've got right and uh, since governments have dropped the ball uh, and here i'm like quoting almost uh, kate i know that you had something in, in one publication last week on that you know governments have dropped the ball and so um uh, facebook stepped into the void and tried to to come up with some kind of source of independent accountability um most of what I think the sort of importance of a lot of what happened at least this week is just to reveal how they're going to think about these issues, um, what kind of sources of law are important, uh, uh, important what kind of um, 
procedures are they going to adopt? How much are they going to rely on uh, experts? How do they view their jurisdiction? How willing will they be both to check Facebook and make recommendations on policy? I've got lots of disagreements with the way that they did it, but but I would be surprised if I didn't. You know, um, uh, there's and a lot of you know this week it's about reading the tea leaves about what's going to happen with the most prominent case they're going to deal with, which is the takedown of President Trump. Uh, and so the the it, I think Kate and I both agree that it would have been nice if they had had you know 50 opinions before they took on this major. Uh, decision with deplatforming the president of the United States, but you know, the they, former they, president. Yes, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I really like saying that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's very satisfying. So wait, and, Nate, can, can can I ask you before you go too much farther to yeah. give just a brief overview of like what they did? So they, they issued five decisions, as you mentioned, four of which overturned Facebook's takedowns and one which returned uh, uh, and one which upheld it. And so um, let me uh, let me go from, I don't know, the most mon more mundane to the most controversial. And let me say this, which is that there's the right answer in this in each of these cases is not obvious to me. Right. You could make perfectly good arguments uh, on both sides. So, for example, um, the one case where they they upheld Facebook's um, uh, takedown for hate speech was a um, Azerbaijani uh, case where um, they, there was a uh, piece of hate speech used against. Is it Armenians? Kate, I can't remember. It was it was, um, a, it, was a, it was a statement about about a historical statement about. Um, the preservation of churches in the Armenian conflict uh, versus the same type of effort that had been put into preserving and restoring mosques. And the statement itself was like political and not controversial, but they used a slur. They yeah. used a, a, a slur, but it was in Azerbaijan. It's in Russian. It's in Russian. That's right. Yeah, okay. and, and it is... Russian is rich with slurs. Yeah. Uh, it has a... Uh, they don't go into this in the opinion, but it has a very elaborate, uh, in a way that's un completely untranslatable into English, a very elaborate uh, set of uh, disparagements. And uh, it's a whole like subculture language of cursing. And this is part of that. Um, uh, it is undeniably and unambiguously a slur. Right. Uh, for and they had multiple. They had, for they had multiple kind of, sources, yeah. like and translators all back that up. So that was not. So the issue there, the reason they turned it down was basically, or the reason they didn't right. reverse Facebook was because the slur was in fact a slur, and because there is no intermediary decision between keep it up and take it down that would have like basically accounted for keeping up the the like the the totally fine part of the speech. And taking down the slur. Um, and so that was kind of, that is the kind, I just want to, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to say that like, that is so, such a complicated, um, such a complicated issue of speech, such a complicated issue of administrability, such a complicated issue of proportionality, such a complicated issue of like, how the, I didn't, it was like, I had to read like, refresh all of my stuff on the Azerbaijan like I I didn't know like that much or anything on like I like that in the last like five to ten years on any of this like I hadn't like read anything and so I had to like read all about the Armenian conflict like I don't it was like so 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 in the weeds and it was a 10 page decision and it's just like this is like I just want to point out that this was one of the four user cases that the court took um in which, like, of 150 people, of 150,000... 150,000 appeals. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I said yeah, yeah. people. 150,000 yeah. people who asked to have their cases heard. And, like, you know, they spent multiple, multiple, multiple hours, dozens of hours deliberating and then coming to this conclusion. So can I ask a... I, I, I want to try to, in each of these cases, distill a principle for what it means for Facebook. And I'm going to get a little graphic with this. Mm -hmm. uh, so does this mean that it is legit for Facebook to have a set of words, red line words, 
that if you call somebody a kike, a bitch, a cunt, you are, there is a presumption that that material will be taken down and, um, and if you, and that there's a kind of red line rule here um, that is legit in the eyes of the, uh, of the oversight board, or is it more contextual than that? Well, I, I think you could have both, right? So that there may be some words that are prohibited, um, but that in the general kind of hate speech realm that there's, you know, context may matter. So each one of those words you mentioned, right, sometimes can be used by the group themselves in an empowering way, right? And so then they're going to have to try to unpack this. The problem, let me, just, before we get ahead of ourselves here, the problem in thinking about each one of these decisions in the same way that we think about a court is that how do you implement this stuff to, you know, 3 billion users, right? So that you cannot, um, you cannot go through the level of analysis that they do in this um, Azerbaijani case um, at the front end of the speech, right? I mean, it's just too resource intensive. So these are mainly just, um, you know, you know, delineating principles uh, that are going to, you know, get, that are going to sort of send signals to the content moderation teams as to what they should be paying attention to down the line. So, you know, that, that's why I think the most important question is always, you know, how do they set their agenda? How do they get from the 150,000 um, appeals to just five cases? Um, what are the implications? What are the moderation teams going to take away from these decisions? The, um, uh, just to jump quickly to another case, the, for me, the most controversial decision they issued had to do with hydroxychloroquine and COVID misinformation. Oh, the COVID case. Yeah, because explain that real quick. In, in so that one, I'm deciding whether to write an article on because th this is also one thing that does concern me about the oversight board is that I don't think they quite appreciate the technology that is used in the filtering process and, and that um, you know, there are technically sophisticated folks on the board, but it, it, most of the people were not hired <laughs> on that basis, I think. And so the, the story in that case is that they have um, uh, a, a person was basically saying, look, we here in France uh, ought to be able to go with this uh, doctor's recommendation to have, uh, you know, get people hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. Uh, and Facebook took it down under its disinformation leading to imminent harm policy. Okay, and the 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 board said no. This is not. Uh, first, they say there this is not imminent, and that 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 in and of itself, I think, is a problem because nothing is going to be imminent online. You know, and then and as you start thinking about this in comparison to you know with, and how that might relate to the Donald Trump case, I, I'm a little concerned about that. And then secondly, like th this is one of these areas where I don't see why this is such a um, it's so important not, uh, you know, that the costs of over enforcement exceed the benefits of, um, you know, keeping uh, of taking down the speech. It's like, OK, so fine. You, you end up taking down something that's borderline disinformation because you've got an over you're really worried about the pandemic. And this is this is why I think it is wrong to think about Facebook as like a, a government, where they're where they're gonna you know where the cost of over enforcement might be something you'd be worried about. It's like they could just make a decision. Hey, we're not going to have discussions advocating for hydroxychloroquine on our platform until we're sure that it's going to you know. Uh, All right. Something. So I want to I want to ask you both this. Um, I, I'm going to be functionally moderator here because this decision disturbed me. It seemed the COVID to me. One? Yeah. It I seemed have, like, to me. So many thoughts. It seemed to me to say, uh, we're going to apply a Brandenburg v. Ohio kind of standard to medical disinformation, whereas Facebook seemed to me to be saying, we don't want the Facebook platform to be used to create widespread misunderstanding that will cause people in certain percentages to do things that will get themselves killed or get other people badly treated mm -hmm. um, uh, or not taking medical advice. And so my question is, uh, and I, I'm interested in both of your thoughts on it. Um, Brandenburg is the standard for violence. 
uh, imminent lawless action is when a Ku Klux Klan rally, I'm, I'm just remembering the facts of Brandenburg, yeah. is talking about overthrowing the government and killing blacks and Jews. Mm -hmm. This is literally a speech at a Klan rally. And that strikes me as a wholly different thing from saying, if you get sick, yeah. take hydroxychloroquine. Um, and so my question is, how much of this, uh, how much of Facebook's entire last year of crackdown on medical disinformation falls if you apply an imminent standard? Well, if you apply an imminent standard, then a lot of it is going to fall, right? Because there's nothing about medical disinformation writ large that is going to satisfy a Brandenburg test, right? Because yes, a lot completely. of it. And so, but, but what's interesting about this is that, so this again is disinformation that leads to offline harm. That's the that's the category uh, in the community standard, which which led to the takedown here. And so what you get this, the sense from the oversight board's uh, decision is that Facebook needs some other kind of policy to deal with medical disinformation, that this imminent uh, threat to off uh, to causing offline harm from disinformation is not going to cut it. Um, and, and, and as in so many of these cases, they, they say, oh, you've got to be more specific here. You've got to be more clear. You've got to like they have this case dealing with someone who puts up a quote by Go, uh, Goebbels. Right. And, okay. and, but, and, and so my, but my point is here that, like, I agree. This is for me one of the reasons why international human rights law, which is what they, they hook their uh, sale to in these cases, is the wrong way to think about these issues, because, you know, yeah, maybe you don't want the government sanitizing public discourse when it comes to COVID, but, but Facebook should be able to do that. Okay, so I just want to take one second because I think we dove in a little too fast because just to frame it for the for everyone who's just like not aware of kind of like the timeline of what's been happening, what the Facebook oversight board is. I only say this because like after having studied it for so long and researched it, I am just acutely aware of how much no one has any idea when it's happening until they they themselves suddenly realize that it's happening and then discover it for the first time and think that it's like like the con law the con law was served uh, <laughs> <laughs> um there's a there's a anyways um but my point is is that basically so there were facebook in um no sorry oversight board uh right before the election opened up um their appeals process and took uh six cases one got mooted um, because it was ended up the user ended up withdrawing the appeal. Um, but then it took another one. And so it took four four cases that were appealed from users who thought that their speech was taken down wrongfully by Facebook. And two, that Facebook had referred to it. Um, of the four cases that were appealed by users, there was a, um, a case from a, um, a, uh, a breast cancer um, organization that had tried to promote a bunch of pictures that fell afoul of um, Facebook's um, uh, adult nudity guidelines uh, by showing female nipples. Um, there was a case with a person who had been prompted to reshare a memory of a post he had previously shared like two years prior that had been a Goebbels quote, the Nazi, the Nazi um, henchman, like Goebbels, like that had, uh, had been shared without any comment. He reshared it and was, it was taken down and it was a strike against him. And I think it can't tell whether he was banned or temporarily suspended. And then there was, I can't think of a fast story to be an one. Well, basically, no anti-Muslim hate speech yeah. based off of basically that, that attached to the famous picture of the child, you know, in the Syrian oh, conflict. The, the Syrian conflict, right? And, but it took aim. But, it, it, took but, aim but it, said, it said Muslims are psychologically, uh, there's a psychological problem with Muslims, right? And so that, that ran foul of the hate speech yeah. policy. And so, but, and then there, but all but the Azerbaijani one, they, they overturned they overturned, which means that the speech went back up. And so if you're a fan of the, the takeaway from this is if you're, you think that Facebook should be doing more to police speech and take down harmful speech, then this, uh, these, these decisions are kind of ant antithetical to that. And if you think that like the, that like there's a chance that, um, you know, Facebook is too free speech um, uh, in favor, this, 
maybe goes against this maybe says oh no you thought facebook was pro free speech well look at the oversight board and then there's another side in which it says um well none of these are administrable decisions this is a one-off series of decisions from this oversight board that applies only in this narrow way to these exact rulings and these are just not going to be decisions that are going to be taken down writ large. And so let me just like talk briefly about Goebbels because I think that like it goes to the COVID-19, it like illustrates the COVID-19 harm in a really useful way. So the Goebbels quote is great. Someone puts up this Goebbels quote in 2017 on their, on their Facebook feed. And it happens synchronistically with something that Trump is doing or saying at the time that was very public and newsy. So it seems like in context at the moment, it rolls through this person's friend's feeds. The girl's quote seems to obviously be an American commenting on the fascist nature of Trump not someone trying to curry or like Nazi favor, right? But fast forward, as we all unfortunately have lived through for the past three years in which like neo-Nazis in America have become a real threat, their ability to to rally each other and to, to share information and to share misinformation online has become a real threat. There's been a huge crackdown. So the, the, the couple of interesting things about this, one, Facebook prompted this person to share this by giving them it to them as a memory and being like, like, do you want to share this post again? And they did it. And then like, it was like, aha, we got you. Um, and then there was this element of like, well, is it so obvious if you share, like, is it, can you just share Goebbels quote or is it going to be, um, is that like a, a state, a political statement to share a quote? Or is that like obviously incitement or lionization of hate figures or whatever? And so I want to just kind of like have a moment to talk about the fact that like that is such a hard decision and what Nate has been really like like honed right in on is that there is this technical element of scalability to these things and there is also just like an incentive structure in place that is very different than the traditional Brandenburg as Ben pointed out kind of like structure and everything else that we see in a first amendment context like communication was just different when Brandenburg was like when Brandenburg happened. And so to this point, I just kind of want to say if Facebook to Facebook, they put out all these nets, right? They've got all of these nets out and they're going to like, they're trying to catch some sharks and they're going to catch fish and they're going to catch dolphins. They're going to, they don't care if they literally catch a hundred dolphins and fish and like whatever else. And like, they're going for that one shark. And they don't care if they take it on all these false positives of people that are sharing this speech in a way that is like, and the question is, and this is like ever the question is like, well, is it so bad to silence those voices? And for all of those false positives, is it so bad for speech? Is it so bad for like freedom of information? Is it so bad for like political, um, political discourse and, like as Jeff Rosen said, the virtue, like questioning your own virtue and thinking through these big problems and self-governance. Or is it worth it to catch that one person, the one neo-Nazi that did put up the Goebbels post because he really wanted to lionize him? To Ben, to your point, like there are so many words that trigger takedown now. And it used to be, and it, like there, and there's so many false positives and there's so many people that just feel completely Like Lauren victimized. and me. Yeah. And in lieu of fun, and you know, we exactly. used we used the word QAnon because we were doing a show with, uh, you know, the oh Atlantic God, executive so editor who wrote an article about the QAnon movement. And we continue to have algorithmic problems. Hope they're done now uh, with Facebook as a result. And I I think there are many fewer contexts in which you could use a, a racial or ethnic slur uh, in a, but there are, as Nate says, the sort of uh, self-empowering ways. Yeah. I mean, you know, all the Jews who are tweeting uh, amusedly about the Jewish space laser, right. including me. Um, and um, uh, 
we're, I mean, we're I joking about it. No, but I, not be able to say Jewish space laser. Like, I, I mean, I, 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 if you restrict <laughs> my right to say Jewish space laser, you are fucking with the wrong guy. I thought in your, in your case, I thought it'd be the Jewish baby cannon. But uh, well, you know, I mean, you know, so. look, an Orthodox friend of mine even tweeted and uh, texted me the other day. Who needs baby cannons when we have <laughs> Jewish space lasers? I mean. <laughs> uh, but but really all of, need a new baby cannon. <laughs> <laughs> but all of the pew, all pew, of pew. these things, all of these stand. So take something like violence, right? Any of the graphic depictions of violence, right? They, they the algorithms and the community standards have to take into account to all right. How on the and Kate's written a lot about this um, from her uh, New Yorker piece, right? How do you deal with the Christchurch situation on the one hand, but also don't censor all of the first person shooter video game um, right. videos, which is a huge amount of content. I mean, that, that's like, my kids watch this stuff on, on all the platforms all the time. Um, and you say, you know, look, but, but this is why I am just not troubled by over enforcement here. Um, um, you know, if you see, particularly in context like COVID disinformation, like, like what really is the, the big harm if it turns out that you can't have this freewheeling discussion that will lead to, um, uh, you know, questioning, you know, maybe th that hydroxychloroquine, uh, it, you know, the ban on it is is really um, so severe or not. And so that's what, and part of it is because I really do not see the First Amendment or international human rights law as being the right guidepost for the way that the Facebook oversight board or the company should view its role, right? So if, if Facebook decides no quotes from Nazis is going to be one of the, you know, it'll it'll add it to that list of then you can't words. quote justice jackson's dissent in termini yeah, yellow yeah, yeah, yeah. he quotes goebbels sure sure it's, but, but there's like tons but like oh part of me part of me relishes this moment of awakening not that i don't always but like it's just so it's so it's so inner it's so iterative it's like I got this call for me, a very good newspaper's editorial board um, after the Facebook oversight board. They said, we're thinking of doing, we're thinking of doing um, an editorial about this, this Supreme Court thing that Facebook has set up. I'm like, you know, like a bunch of your columnists have written about it and you've got people covering. They're like, oh, oh, okay, we'll find that. We'll go look it up. I'm like, man. No one understands quite how much the editorial board of like a, of a of a major newspaper does not talk to the other like people in the editorial department. But anyway, um, they were just kind of like, you know, so it seems like this just it doesn't you know it can only like have these the the rulings are really narrow. Like there's only and I'm like, we've known that for like that was we knew that like 18 months ago. Like that was like announced 18 months ago. They're like, oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, if you write that, you're going to sound stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> But there's this whole, like, there's this, what I mean is to say by this is like, there is just this inner awakening around all of this. And I do think that there's something really fascinating about something like the COVID-19 case in this, in this instance, in which like the board is talking about basically, in my estimation, the difference between an opinion and a lie um, and like and a harmful lie. A harmful lie or an opinion uh or a potentially harmful lie in an opinion and like those are decisions that like i'll like I, i've told ben this i've talked about this before i did a i was clerking on the second circuit when michael lewis's book came through um and there was a big suit for defamation over the big short someone mm -hmm. and like we, there was like 37 claims and I remember I had to go through every single claim and determine if they were like truth or lie or opinion or like whatever and like it's a pretty strict standard and that's in first amendment land um most things are probably opinion it's really hard to prove a lie and we're in a completely different world now in which like as Nate points out there's no harm in like maybe maybe for a limited period of time silencing one person because that harmful lie could pretend or like that opinion might have really harmful consequences. Okay, so I, I want to ask a, 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 a meta question here, which is, it actually seems to me like the Facebook Oversight Board is applying something like First Amendment standards 
but it's routing them through the language of the ICCPR rather than through First Amendment yes. case law. Absolutely. And but and through the charter. So it's both their interpretation of international human rights law, but also the, the charter of the Facebook Oversight Board and how it emphasizes voice and all that kind of stuff. And so my, I, what bothers me about this is if you apply the, like, you know, you have a bunch of crazed ass conservatives, not to, to use a technical term, um, uh, running around saying Facebook is, you know, or Twitter is violating people's First Amendment rights. This is a threat to the First Amendment. And you have a whole bunch of us saying, wait a minute, the First Amendment is actually not at issue in private mm -hmm. enforcement of terms of service. And then all of a sudden, the oversight board starts interpreting the community, the, the hybrid of the community standards, the, uh, uh, the ICCPR and the charter as basically implementing something like the First Amendment. It's got an imminent standard. It's got like, you know, uh, there are some magic word hate speech stuff that's okay. You can't, you can't basically call an Azerbaijani a camel rider. Uh, uh, but you can, you know, show, you can say, hey, like Muslims in general are sort of psychologically damaged and show a picture of a dead baby by ev as evidence of that. People you get are into horrified the, by that decision. I'm um, like, I have to say, I think it's kind of horrifying. No. Um, and so my, I, I guess what I'm left with is, if we're, a, like, are we backdoor applying First Amendment standards to Facebook? And isn't this completely contrary to what we've all said we wanted over the last four years, which is the platforms to take the, the disinformation problem seriously. Well, yes, I think that, um, look, part of the problem here is that the oversight board is only empowered right now to review takedowns, right? So there is going to come a time in the next few months when people will go to the oversight board and say, look, Take, here's speech that Facebook left up and I want you to review it to take it down. And so the fact that they've been quite libertarian in the four of the five decisions that they've issued right now might be just a function of the fact that the only thing they can really do is overturn a takedown because those that's the pool of appeals that they're getting. That's, the, that's, that's just the procedural thing. The second point is, yes, you are right. Um, and those who thought that the oversight board was going to be a PR win for Facebook are missing the boat here because for reasons that you say, most people want Facebook to take, most people around the world and in the U.S. want Facebook to take down more stuff, not take down less. And so um, the, the idea that they're going to be leaving up COVID disinformation and the like. Now, th this is where the Trump case is going to be most significant because I, if you read this, this COVID case the way I do, I don't know how they can uphold the lifetime ban on Donald Trump. I mean, because if, if you analogize Facebook to a public square, you know, a, a state authority regulating the public square, when, when can you ban someone from their life speaking in the public square, right? And that's that's by way of saying that, look, this is not the right way to think about it. And, and so whether it's First Amendment or international human rights standards, either way, I think that it leaves out a lot of what are legitimate sort of regulatory concerns that a company could take uh, to regulate the speech on the platform. I completely agree with Nate. I'm just going to say that add that I think that what this is showing us too is that like First Amendment standards are maybe not as far from like from international human rights standards and freedom of expression as we thought they were. Um, and that like that there has been kind of a gradual kind of a um, belief that these, you know, especially in places where democracy has um, has been struggling, um, that there's a, like a, a, a feeling that there's a need to protect these platforms for that. But I do want to say that like, you saw the board say over and over again here, that um, there was an issue with proportionality. And I do agree with Nate that that is going to be key to the proportionality of the ban with Trump, in my opinion, like, I think that the, I don't know anything, I haven't like talked to anyone. There's just like, I think that like, this is turning into as like, it's funny that we ended up talking about Brandenburg because I just think that like, there's so little relevant about Brandenburg. Like Brandenburg 
is just not the world we live in. It's just not how communication is transferred anymore or shared or preserved or how, how communication kind of like leads to things. I mean, it is, but there's a different type of problem that we've kind of like, that has exposed itself in the last cup in the last 10 years. And I think that there's, I think that there's going to be this really interesting, like if you need to say it, you can hold and like wait in a timeout or something. There's going to be some type of like, I guess I hadn't thought put it in this term, but like kind of, um, uh, Oh God, what is the thing? Um, the, before you speak, the um prior restraint prior restraint thank you that there's some type of oh my gosh thank you <laughs> that there's some type of prior restraint on speech and i think that that's in an era where this is just moving at scale all over the globe like this like what's wrong with a prior restraint on hydro like hydrochloroquine or like i i can't even i've never been able to pronounce that yeah word. well but so, so so just to unpeel this a little bit um if you look at the way that the oversight board has described the Donald Trump case, there's already some kind of negative language in there about what Facebook did. So they say Facebook has not indicated whether any of its other community standards, such as violence and incitement or coordinating harm, were also violated. In, in addition, you know, Facebook Facebook did the following things, pointing in the direction that they, you know, there are vague standards here, right? But but anyone who's tried to grapple with the problem of writing these, these community standards knows that you cannot write them in, in the level of specificity that everybody wants because you have to deal with, you know, on a global scale, you've got to deal with, let's say with, with um, uh, leaders, anything that might come out of the mouth of Duterte or Modi or, or Bolsonaro, Trump, as well as Merkel and you know, others who, who are opposing them. And it's, it's very, very difficult uh, to come up with uh, the kind of specificity that, this, that the Facebook oversight board seems to have required in each one of these decisions, right? And, and remember, the only way, the only thing that really matters uh, from a, from the standpoint of regulating speech on the uh, on the platform is whether any of these signals can be implemented um, through automation, right? I mean, because that is where it's all going. The, the yes. rubber is going to meet the road, and you cannot. Yes. You know, if you and I were to, to you cannot. Bingo. Well, we can't take Brandenburg. We're really far right? from that, though, Nate. Like people have to, people think have a like an un. They're totally off with thinking what the technology can do, but it will get there eventually. But, but, but I'm hung up on something antecedent to that. I totally agree with you that implementability algorithmically is important and is the ultimate standard. But there's something that, that I, look, I haven't read any of these opinions. I've only read the, uh, uh, the accounts of them that we've had on Lawfare. Um, but there's something different about, like, they're treating them at least in the summaries that I've read, they're treating these questions as though the there is some underlying fundamental right on the part of the individuals yeah. to yeah. express themselves on Facebook. And I'm sorry, Facebook's job is to provide a pleasurable experience to its users. It is not like the day it holds itself out as a media platform, as a... Um, you know, as a uh, vehicle for the expression of the fundamental rights of the human race, I'll feel differently about it. Well, but that's but what the but that's what the charter. This is this is where the the decisions were made in creating the oversight board to take a different view of this than you do, right? Which is that they have decided through the charter to ensure, you know, say that the role of the oversight board is to look to international law and to look to these uh, other larger principles that are not just about pleasure, pleasant experience of the user. Uh, and that, you know, that was a decision. Um, I yep. disagreed with some of that, you know, but that that's, um, that's where they, they went. And, um, you know, th that is why for those who, who, who criticize even like having a discussion like this, that we're taking to taking Facebook oversight board too seriously, and that it's just a way to let Facebook off the hook. The answer is no. Facebook is still responsible for all of this, right? All of the speech that's on the platform that they leave up or that they take down. And, and, and the fact that they are going to deflect some of the decisions to an oversight board shouldn't restrain any of us in saying, look, that Facebook should still be um, more aggressive in, in some of the takedown policies.
All right. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Um, I wanted to make sure that Fubar, who is a, a longtime denizen of the chat, but who has, I think, never before consented to come on screen. Uh, and so we learned today that Fubar is male, uh, which has always been a matter of uh, uh, uncertainty. Uh, uh, welcome to the actual screen. And I wanted to make sure you got a chance to ask your question today because all three of us have thoughts on this matter. Thanks, Ben. And I have been on before uh, about time zones. Oh, Thank you. well, that I was a long time that. ago. It was a long time ago. Um, yeah. Well, I apologize for forgetting, but uh, s second time on the screen. It's been 311 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so I was a bit surprised seeing the uh, reaction around Evelyn's uh, uh, piece on the Facebook oversight board and receiving embargoed materials. And I was honestly, I was surprised uh, seeing you having to defend that, Ben, because I thought this was like well understood to be common practice that, you know, you send embargoed materials over to media organizations, uh, give them enough time to write up coherent, useful pieces, and then and then, you know, they, they publish it on the day or the moment the embargo lifts and we do it all the time for, you know, reviews for hardware, software and everything. Yep. So just wondering, like, is how much of this outrage is fake? Like, is it like similar to Gamergate? Like just trying to like smear lawfare or trying to, you know, poke some holes yeah. into... Yeah, so I, I think we each have, uh, thank you for posing that. I think we yeah, each thanks. have thoughts on that. Nate, uh, uh, say your piece, Kate, say yours, and then I will uh, go medieval on Evelyn's critics on this. <laughs> well, let me just say you quickly. You have like an axe behind you. So it's, it's, it's I, not, I am furious about this. It's not clear that people from the question maybe understand the full context, but there's been some criticism of Evelyn Dueck's uh, article that she was able to post such an, a long analysis of these decisions so quickly after that. That and and so she, like many other journalists, got an early look at the at the decisions. Um, and yes, it's true that that happens all the time, whether it's from the platforms or other institutions. Um, but this is also one of the ways that Facebook, the Oversight Board, is not the Supreme Court, right? Because people are taking to this the idea, you know, the the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't like give its opinions out to a special group of journalists. Everybody gets it uh, at, at the same time, and so it's just another way. But I think that. I mean, certainly, I, I mean, there's the larger story here, which is there's accusations of certain academics getting privileged access to the platforms and and that the platforms will only choose those academics who um, are uh, basically going to write favorable things about them, which is certainly not Evelyn's track record. Um, look, I, I have a lot to say in this since I worked on uh, trying to do the same thing to get academic access to Facebook data through something called Social Science One that I started with Gary King. Um, I think that is a legitimate criticism of any academic working in this area that they have to be, um, uh, you know, that they they have to be dem they must demonstrate independence and that there is a worry that these that the platforms are going to co-op academics. Uh, and so, you know, and I, at Stanford, Lord knows, you know, it's something it's a line that I have to walk quite a bit. Um, uh, but in in this case, the the idea because the, the same access that Evelyn had was stuff that a lot of journalists had. So it was just about giving out the opinions to a whole pool of journalists so they could write their dis, um, their pieces once the decisions came out. Um, I was just gonna say that I had um, I don't I Nate I do want to like I'm not gonna make I don't know particularly but i don't think that all of the journal that i'll big that part of the reason this is a big deal is that because the general pool of journalists found out about the decisions the day of like a couple hours before they were coming out and then they had access to them and like evelyn had them like a little bit before but to that point like evelyn has done just this insanely diligent job of breaking out and incredibly great prose and incredibly thoughtful, incredibly, incredibly smart and detailed um, uh, reporting. Everything that's happened on the oversight board. And she's one of the only people besides me who's given a shit. And like, I have to be honest, there is like this thing when I got access to the oversight board, people were like, 
and not that that many people cared because most people didn't know what it was and thought it was a big like hoo-ha and didn't really think that it was going to be anything um that there was kind of like a there were a few people who had some sour grapes and were kind of like well why didn't we get access like I would like access and like I went like I remember going to like the person like the person at like in PR that I was talking to at Facebook and I was like why did you give me access to this stuff and they were like oh like well you asked like you specifically came to us and you made this specific request to like follow up, follow around like this thing. And you had this, like you were a serious like person and you really wanted to write about it seriously. And you didn't want to like just do a hit piece or whatever. So of course we're going to like let you in. And there seems to me to be something really fundamentally at odds here between the public constantly clamoring that these are such secretive platforms. And so like, they don't let anyone in, they don't do anything. And then like, you know, they let people in even people like, by the way, like lots of people have uh, tons of like really like illustrative access into like Facebook and other places. Like Casey Newton wrote like this great piece about content moderation, labor policies at Facebook that dragged Facebook through the mud, but they gave him all this access and like no one's talking about that. And like my point, my, my point here is that like, I just think that like literally like everyone to a certain extent is waking up to the because of the trump decision to like the power that this board is going to have and the seriousness of it and at people like evelyn have been there in the weeds when no one cared and doing the hard work and because she was doing the hard work they like gave her like a little bit of like i don't even know that she got the decisions early so much as like case summaries early that's what i got like i got case no she got the early. decisions early she got the decisions early yeah but like 12 hours just... early okay like i might have gotten them also around them but like i haven't even opened the files honestly because i just knew i couldn't like write about it immediately and so it was just kind of fine but there's like i i i've been like I have obviously have been really busy for the past two days just with life stuff. And so I haven't been able to weigh into this Twitter debate as much as I can, but like, I just, and it's also kind of dangerous to kind of like stick your name into like the fray, but like, there's nothing different. Like Evelyn did everything right. Nothing wrong. She is only guilty of being like one of the best people writing in this space. And one of like the, like the best kind of legal minds I think coming up right now. And I just, I, I read everything she writes and it makes me think more about kind of like what I'm going to say. And like, I really appreciate having her in this space. So just one little uh, coda to that, which is, look, we all, everybody needs, everyone who works in this field needs to be on the alert for the possibility that the platforms are manipulating them. That is, yes. a, re that is a real risk. And, and you realize it, Evelyn realizes it. And, you know, that um, you, know, you cannot just, we have to make sure there's not a regime where they just give access to people who they think are gonna be fawning of them. Now, Evelyn's been plenty critical uh, of the platforms, but th this is something, and, and Josh Tucker and I go into this in our um, book on social media and democracy about how, you know, th there is the risk of this, not just in, in this, looking at the platform policies like this, but also in data access that we need to have some kind of regime in order to force them uh, to open up to a broader set of people that they will not be able to hand pick. Uh, and so I published something this week just trying to you know, propose legislation on how to do that um, so that it isn't, you know, that they can't just pick people who are, who are favorable to them. But Ben, you wanted to go medieval. Go medieval. I like that like now you're very well framed with the ax. It's I like, have- It's like the, the look is perfect. I have a lot of thoughts on this subject, and I want to first disclose my bias, which is that I am Evelyn's editor at Lawfare, and um, uh, at what Evelyn did in this case was done in consultation with Lawfare's managing editor, i.e. Quinta Jurassic, and with me, the editor-in-chief of the site. Um, and so to the extent that people are criticizing what Evelyn did, they're also criticizing me uh, and Quinta. Um, uh, and so, you know, factor that in however you want to what I'm about to say, which is going to be pretty harsh. Um, but there's something else going on here, and it's about uh, senior academics kicking down at junior academics. And, uh, and it's super ugly. 
Um, and don't do uh, it, yo. Uh, just, just don't fucking do it. Um, so just like what Evelyn the tweet and then delete it. <laughs> what Evelyn did in this case is the most normal journalistic practice. Uh, I that you know I have been on both literally on both sides of this when lawfare has a cool set of data sometimes. I will call the New York Times and say, hey, we're going to release this. Do you want it exclusively embargoed until we release it? I do that. It's a routine interaction. Uh, and by the way, is it part of my PR strategy in releasing information? You bet your ass it's part of my PR strategy. And is when I do that with, with New York Times reporters and they play into it, are they playing into my hands? No. Our Venn diagrams of interest overlap. They have an interest in getting information early so they can study it. And I have, an, uh, I have interest in having smart reporters who know the subject look at our work and look at the stuff that we've acquired in a fashion that is uh, likely to produce serious coverage. So I want to defend here not merely Evelyn, I want to defend the fucking oversight board. What they did, like, it is perfectly reasonable. There's a bunch of people, and Jim Grimmelman, uh, I want to James say. Who, Grimmelman. Yeah, James Grimmelman. James Grimmelman. The best. Who has, such, uh, like. He is such a champion of, like, younger academics. It, it, is so to good it is totally okay to have a debate about whether the oversight board should be doing this and whether that's, a, like, best practices on their part or not. I actually will defend it. I think. Uh, and I'll defend it on the grounds that, you know, nobody else wrote anything like what Evelyn wrote. And I shared it in the it's chat. It's so good. Um, it is... Uh, a, I disagree with it, but that's not... That has nothing to do with anything. It's four, really smart. Four, <laughs> four days later, there's nothing else like it. Yep. And no. so that's for the oversight was. board to say, hey, let's get one of the most interesting people, right, you know and make sure she has time so she can, uh, you know, like, I don't have a problem with that. If you've got a problem with that, take it up with the oversight board. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you're a senior academic um, who wants to talk about a junior academic, be careful how you do that. Because um, it is, uh, be, look, Adam Davidson, who, who, you know, is a, a podcast legend, has been on the show, uh, created Planet Money and was a New Yorker writer for a long time. He tweeted today that he was gobsmacked that I had to spend time defending this. It was so routine. Jeff Jarvis said the same thing. This is not a controversial practice among people who do this shit for a living. And I'm totally proud of what Evelyn wrote on Lawfare. I have zero problem with what she did. And I will say this, uh, no offense to any of the people who behaved like jerks in, in piling on to Evelyn about this, but, you know, none of them are mainstream journalists. Not one. And I just want to say no, main, no journalist for a mainstream media publication will criticize this because that's what we do. Also, can and, I just and I get I... information embargoed all the time. It's one of the ways that I do better work, and so I'm just not inclined to be apologetic about this at all. And by the way, if you're one of the people who's been like piling on to Evelyn over the last few days, fucking shame on you. That's all I have to say on the subject. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say really quickly. Here's the other thing, Ben. Even if someone, even if the oversight board had fucking given this pile of decisions to a bunch of journalists that are overworked and completely underpaid in this pandemic with this, like with some type of embargo, none of them would have turned out the kind of quality of like, of, of what, of what, like, and they still have it with, to your point. And like, my point is, is like, if you'd asked, like, if they'd asked, they probably would have gotten it, but they didn't. And like Evelyn asked her, she like, she and I probably like are just constantly, I'm constantly like, every three days, two days, I like send an email to the comms team yep. 
And I'm just like, hey, any updates? Gotta update me. Because you guys are interested (laughs) in the institutional work. And by the way, this is going to be shocking to a lot of people. There are a bunch of people at the Department of Defense and at the Department of Justice who over time make sure I see public filings from the department, you know, and they're not like leaking stuff. They just make sure Lawfare knows about stuff that comes out. Um, That is part of the routine interaction between people who write and follow issues on a systematic basis and the people they're covering. And the idea that Evelyn has had to spend the last few days uh, uh, being attacked by people who actually aren't doing the work themselves uh, is ridiculous. And I just want to say I'm not... Uh, no part of me feels apologetic uh, and on her behalf, not that I'm authorized to speak for her, she should repent nothing and apologize to nobody. That's all I got. We should all have such good bosses, right, Nate? (laughs) Indeed, yes. I mean, I'm not Evelyn's boss. I just feel really strongly about this. I know, I think it, but it's nice. Well, let let me say one larger thing. And this also, this is me being a, a little patrician here as the, as the elder academic in all of this. That this, um, in this field of social media studies writ large, however we define it, there is a meanness that I don't see in my other fields. Uh, oh that, you know, and you know, I mean, Ben, I was just on another podcast or a, a live thing with you this weekend. So like in the election administration field or election law or even constitutional law, where we're, and, and it's not like these other areas don't have have a uh, high temperature and the issues that we're dealing with. But there's something about people who study polarization online and hate speech and the like, which then leads them to become a lot more um, uncivil uh, and, and vicious. I, I'm, you know, I've been on the receiving end of it. I'm certain that, you know, Kate and, and you have. Uh, and it's something that, that I do worry about because it, it means that in this field, it's kind of going to kind of have a stultifying effect on, on some of the range of inquiries that we engage in. All right, we should leave it there. Oh my gosh! So one I have like of eight million more things to say about the decisions. We feel like we didn't even touch on them. Like they're so crazy. Some of like some of the like I, not crazy. Like just so interesting. I'm just there. Will, I, there will be so many more opportunities because as as the uh, oversight <laughs> board turns more it's and happening. more in to the. Uh, uh, the stultifying First Amendment jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. Uh, we will, we will find that those of us who have been interested in it ha- are now pulling our hairs out and saying, "Why on earth did we create an institution to prevent Facebook from doing what we want it to do?" <laughs> um, but um, uh, I'm maybe getting a little I bit ahead of myself. I, no, I'm <laughs> even ahead of you. And I think we're I, like, I'm at the you that's like 10 years from now is like so happy that it's not a bunch of like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey's in a room somewhere <laughs> in Silicon Valley, like making these decisions. I think well, that it's going to J- be a Jack, Jack Dorsey was in Polynesia on an island when he made the yeah, decision to deplatform. <laughs> <laughs> 50 degrees in my apartment right now. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to let Kate go for a run around her apartment to warm up. I'm going to um, go run to Target by space heaters. By space heaters. <laughs> yeah, we that's are a, going- sure, a surefire way not to create a fire there, Kate. So good yeah. luck. <laughs> Uh, well, she's she's gonna she's gonna burn like candle. a kerosene like <laughs> bonfire in the middle of her living room. Um, so uh, one thing, since we had guests on both Just Us Saturday and on Mystery Guest Sunday, one thing we did not do this week weekend is plan the show for oh, the week. Yeah. We have no idea what we're gonna do, um, and so uh, whatever it is. Uh, it will be, uh, it will start 22 hours and 55 minutes from now. And until then, we'd say we don't have fun anymore, but we do have Evelyn Dweck. And, you know, sometimes she gets, you know, information on an embargoed basis. And to everybody who has a problem with that, just don't read Lawfare. Just, you've got lots of options of things to read. Uh, so read less less good material <laughs> elsewhere. That's your choice. Nate, thank you so much. Thanks we for having will-